after God had come to reassure Abraham that he will fulfill the promise, we, we now turn in Genesis 18 and 19 to a well-known, even infamous story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, this is a, a text which reminds us that Lot had moved there a number of years ago. And uh, while Abraham is sitting by his tent, he notices three visitors that approach. And according to verse 1 of chapter 18, it includes the Lord. Now, notice the tremendous hospitality that Abraham shows to these three visitors. And uh, in the ancient Near East, hospitality is very important. And this is going to contrast later with the lack of hospitality and worse that the people of Sodom show to the three visitors and even the kind of tepid hospitality that Lot shows to to them, though that will separate Lot from the inhabitants of Sodom as well. But it's an extravagant kind of hospitality. Uh, they use three sayas of grain, and that's 36 pounds. I think the text is just emphasizing the fact that they're just giving an abundance of welcome to these three. Um, now, God again reassures Abraham that Sarah will bear a son, and now he says, quote, in about a year. And in response to this, Sarah laughs because she's getting older, obviously, and she's been waiting a long time. Uh, and of course, her laughter, which will be repeated after the birth of her son, will lead to the name of the promised son, namely um, Isaac, which comes from the Hebrew verb to laugh. Um, but now God, accompanied by two angels, informs Abraham that he intends to destroy Sodom for its sins. And here we see an interesting development when Abraham rises up to intercede on behalf of Sodom. And, uh, of course, Lot had moved there, and he probably has concern for Lot. But um, Abraham uh, wants to now uh, try to encourage God to preserve the city on behalf of the righteous. Now, Jim Bruckner in his uh, comment, or in his uh, a monograph on this, these chapters points out that the term outcry here, God says that the outcry of Sodom has reached God. That outcry has a kind of status as what he says, quote, legal complaint requesting deliverance. So here I think we're to see that God is responding to the outcry that he's hearing in regard to Sodom and Gomorrah, and now he's going to adjudicate this charge. But again, Abraham stands up to intercede on behalf of the righteous in Sodom. And here we're to see Abraham acting as a prophet. We tend to think of prophets as those who talk about the future, and indeed they often do. Uh, but, but at the heart of the prophetic task is intercession on behalf of the people. Indeed, later on, uh, we'll see it in the next chapter, Genesis 20, actually Abraham is specifically called a prophet in regard to his intercessory prayer activity. But you could study Moses, as he stands in the breach in Exodus 32, 31 through 33, 23, uh, after the sin with the golden calf, when God contemplates destroying Israel, Moses intercedes on behalf of Israel, or Samuel in 1 Samuel 12, 9 to 25, 
uh, where he promises to pray on behalf of the people. And Jeremiah keeps praying for the people until God finally says to him, stop, don't pray for the people any longer. I'm determined to judge this unrepentant people. So um, Abraham engages in what we would call a little bit of uh, bartering. Even today, if you go to Jerusalem and go into the old city and want to buy something, you might engage in a bit of bartering over the price. And it sounds a little bit like that, where, uh, you know, Abraham says, what if there are 50 people, 50 righteous people in Sodom? Will you destroy it? And God says, no, I won't destroy it if there are 50. What, what about 40? Uh, and he works God down to 10. And God says, yeah, if they're 10, I won't destroy them. But when, he, when God gets there, he uh, discovers that the city is filled with sinful people, less than 10, um, but he still manages to save Lot and his daughters. Now we come to Genesis 19 as the two angels enter into Sodom and encounter Lot. And uh, Lot doesn't show him the same extravagant hospitality, but does encourage them to come home with him and not spend the night in the square. And the reason why we discover later that uh, that Lot doesn't want them to do that is because it would be dangerous because that evening the men of the city come and they uh, want Lot to send the men out so they can have sexual intercourse with them. So let's pause here and, and talk for a moment about what's going on here because uh, reading this text from a modern perspective, we read it a certain way. Why are these men wanting to have sex with uh, the visitors? Um, is everybody in the city of Sodom uh, uh, homosexual? Um, we have to re remember that in ancient Near Eastern society, uh, for a man to force another man to have sex is a way of asserting dominance over them. It, um, it's a way of, of humiliating them by forcing them to play the submissive role in the sexual act. So, um, so that's why in later biblical texts, it looks back on the sin at Sodom and says that uh, what they lacked was hospitality. <laughs> and, um, and so some people use that to say that, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah isn't really a biblical text that uh, talks about the sinfulness of homosexuality. And, and indeed, people need to be careful about how we use this, this text in Genesis 18 and 19. It, it's uh, the question of, of homosexuality is discussed through other biblical texts. Now, on the other hand, I think it's too extreme to say that that there's nothing in the sexual sexuality of this passage which is at issue here because the book of Jude in the New Testament looks back on, on what's happening here in Genesis 19 and says that it involved a kind of sexual transgression. But in any case, it's very clear that the people of Sodom are, are horribly sinful uh, in their attempted rape of these men. And so um, God does decide to destroy the city. But before he does, he removes Lot and his family. Why does he remove Lot and his family? Well, very interestingly, the text tells us that God remembered Abraham. So on behalf 
or for the sake of Abraham, he saves Lot and his family. Now, famously, as they're leaving, Lot's wife looks back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. And it reminds you how, um, uh, I think it is a kind of uh, indication that she was longing for the past, for her life in Sodom. She tarries and dies. Um, and but Lot is saved and his two daughters are saved. But then we get this uh, rather sad story at the end of Genesis 19 where um, Lot and his daughters are kind of holed up alone. And you can imagine the destruction that is all around them where they were. Uh, perhaps they thought Everything was destroyed. And so uh, they get their father drunk, again, reminiscent in this case of the end of Genesis 9 as well and the drunkenness of Noah, where we saw uh, that Canaan was cursed. Um, and here we see a story about the perverse origins of the Moab and Ammon, later enemies of Israel. Uh, through the incestual act of the daughters of Lot. Now, um, of course, Sodom and Gomorrah become <clears throat> a kind of metaphor for sinfulness and for destruction, both in the Old Testament and ultimately in the New Testament. Just like the flood, uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah become anticipatory of the final judgment and often is looked back on in order to give a warning about sinfulness and the need to repent or suffer the future judgment. I'm thinking here of a text like 2 Peter 2, 6 through 8, which says, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes, and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the flesh and despise authority. So Peter uses this in order to encourage us to righteousness and to avoid the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah.